Hi. On this channel, we've done a number of videos on sound. A couple of years ago, we constructed our DML, or Distributed Mode Loudspeaker Panels. We showed you how we put them together, and we also demonstrated how they performed. And if you're interested in that kind of a speaker system, you might want to take a look at those videos, because it's pretty exciting results. Last year, I constructed a more conventional speaker based on what's called a Voigt tube. It combines the effects of a transmission line speaker and a ported design with a single driver. It produced excellent sound reproduction, and we've actually got them set up in the other side of this lab, and we listen to them every day. Also, we did a couple of videos on sound-absorbing panels. Basically, what we wanted to do was analyze some of the materials that we were going to use in the construction of our anechoic chamber, the one we're going to demonstrate upstairs and the one I'm going to show you how we put together in just a couple of minutes. I've decided that I'm going to revisit that by looking at some different types of absorbing materials that can be used to construct your own sound absorbing panels and how they work not just to block sound when the sound comes at them at a normal but also when the sound hits tangentially which is more consistent with how they would be used if you hung them on a wall inside of a listening studio or inside of a, a sound booth and to do that i've actually constructed based on recommendation by one of our commenters uh, egg cartons. There's an urban myth that this is a very good sound absorbing material, and we're going to actually analyze that. More conventional corrugated foam material that you can get on Amazon or any kind of a sound shop to absorb sound. Decided to take advantage of the fact that after the recent human malware event, a lot of people have a lot of extra toilet paper hanging around. And so I thought it might be interesting to, interesting to look at a sound absorbing material that uh, looks funny, but may actually have some of the benefits of the corrugated foam. We're also going to analyze just the simple rock sewell soundboard foam and take a look at how that does uh, without any kind of covering. And based on what DIY Perks, another uh, big YouTube channel did, where he looked at different types of uh, sound absorbing material and found that towels, bath towels, work remarkably well as a sound absorbing material. We're going to test that too. Now to do this test, what I did is I constructed four relatively similar speakers based on four identical drivers. These are relatively low cost drivers. And the differences between the two pairs of speakers are in the enclosure material. This is this very soft, inexpensive, rigid PVC foam board. And here we have fiber reinforced concrete panels. I actually molded them and then grouted them together. And in both all of these cases, I have the ability to do both a sealed design as well as a ported design, and we're going to look at the effect of that as well. In addition to that, we also did a, vid a couple of videos uh, about a year ago on the effects of helium propagation on sound. And so in the back of these enclosures, we have the ability to infuse helium behind the speaker and see what that does to the uh, driver performance. The difference between the two sizes of the speakers is that the internal volumes on all four of them are exactly the same. But in the two larger examples, we've placed a layer of this Roxell foam board inside in order to see what the effects of absorbing the sound, not just bouncing it around inside of the enclosure, will have on the output of the sound. So what we're going to do is we're going to take all this upstairs, we're going to test it in the anechoic chamber, and I'm going to go through with you about the design of our anechoic chamber, how we put it together, and how it works. So I'll see you upstairs. So this is it. We've used this a couple of times, but I've never actually explained the layout and how we constructed it, and I'm going to go through that with you because it's pretty simple, and it's simple enough that I'm not even going to provide you drawings for the particular design. I'm going to give you those principles. You could build this yourself to custom dimensions based on some fairly simple rules. What we did is we took construction grade lumber, just two by fours, US two by fours, and constructed four window frames, essentially four square frames, two here and two more over here. 
And then on the inside, I built a box structure so that the skeleton, the support, is on the outside and the inside of the box is clean without any interfering structure. And then inside of this box, I then place some of the foam and the uh, absorbing material I'll describe later. You'll notice also that this has been constructed in sort of a clamshell, sort of two unequal halves. The reason for that is because of the fact that this entire system here weighs about one ton. And because it's so heavy, even a door with all the padding on it would be so bulky that we would need really robust hinges to allow us to open and close the door on the chamber. So an easier solution was simply to build a static half and then a somewhat smaller half on rollers. And this allows us to open the door and close the door. And then once we close the door and we bring them into approximate uh, alignment here, then I simply take some heavy duty clamps and squeeze everything together. And this locks the two pads together, providing a nice stable seal. Just like politics, engineering is the art of compromise. And you always have to allow for the, uh, the concepts of cost, efficacy, utility, practical application, and even sometimes just aesthetics. And so let me show you how this thing opens up. Just wheel this on its little rollers. And as you can see inside here, I've got some foam material on top of this Roxul soundboard. Underneath this foam is a double layer of 35 millimeter Roxel foam that is then held off of the MDF by small little foam spacers. So there's a little air gap behind it. And then the foam is actually mattress foam because the material that you can normally get for acoustic purposes, you know, this foam that we're going to be testing later, it looks nice, but it's very lightweight and it's relatively expensive. We bought some couple of mattress pads and cut them into uh, rectangular bars, three by three inches or 75 by 75 millimeters. And then on the angled bandsaw, simply sliced each bar in half so that we ended up with the wedge. The concept of the foam is that it absorbs sound much better at high frequencies than low frequencies. But by producing this sort of corrugated surface, what happens is any of the sound waves that hit here tend to at least have somewhat of a tendency to bounce back and forth a little bit. Not trapped, but effectively makes them travel a longer distance and also go through more material on their way into the 75 millimeter or three inch uh, insulating pad behind it then whatever exits on the other side, some of that will go out through the MDF, the hard board, and whatever is reflected back through the absorbing panel will then have to travel through this foam. The foam then acts to help distribute some of that sound so that even though we will get reflection, it will be homogenized and we won't get hot spots. Now, somebody once complained, they said, this isn't an anechoic chamber, you know, they cost tens of millions of dollars and this thing, this thing still reflects sound. There is no such thing as a totally anechoic chamber, no matter how much you spend. They all reflect sound. Unless you could scream in deep space, you're always going to get some reflectivity. But depending on how much you're willing to spend, how thick you're willing to make the material, how deep you're willing to make these corrugations, it's a compromise. And so for a DIY amateur kind of setup to be able to test speakers, this thing works remarkably well, is convenient to use and not that expensive. And you can build it to whatever dimensions you want. It does work as I'll demonstrate. So now on this side, let me also show you something that's important about these things. In a high end anechoic chamber, typically you're walking around on a metal mesh or a screen because they don't want reflections to come from the floor. What I've done rather than try to do that is I place this this removable panel down here. I just put it up on those little wooden posts that you can see down here to allow me to be able to kneel and to stand in order to mount things that I'm going to be putting on the back of the anechoic chamber. And then the material here, which is the foam pad on a small board, is then hung by these straps to pulleys on the back wall that allow me to adjust the height of this relatively non-reflective material and allow me to put the speaker or whatever sound device that we're going to be analyzing at whatever height to get it into the middle of the chamber. 
It is funny, just as an aside, as I put my head in here just to describe this to you, it sounds like somebody just put some wax in my ears. Everything gets real dead. It's, it's a funny kind of sensation. This thing really does block sound. To attach the foam onto these boards, rather than bolt them or screw them, the simplest method was simply to use some of this high performance spray adhesive. Just put this on each surface and in about 60 seconds you push them on and it'll last years. It's a very practical way of attaching all of the foam material on the inside of the chamber. And then behind me, if you look carefully in the center of the chamber, you'll see this tiny little microphone that's extending from the back, of the back wall of the chamber. And what it allows me to do is to sample the sound with a removable microphone. And again, I don't have any hardware inside that's going to reflect sound. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to set up one of the speakers. We're going to put it uh, connected up to the amplifier that I have mounted up over here, just sitting up there. And then we're going to drive this from the computer with the REW or RU equalization or room equalization wizard. It's a software package that you can get online. And we're going to analyze each one of the different speakers in the chamber. And then eventually we're going to put some helium into one of the speakers and then I'm going to finally turn one of the speakers around and you're going to see what kind of sound reflection you have inside the chamber just to give you an idea of how well it performs. So let me get started and get one of the speakers set up. Okay, so this is the first test with the PVC foam board enclosure, no insulation on the inside. And I'm going to close up the chamber, remove this floor pad. I've got it wired up and back. I'm going to do this a lot of times. Like that. Now put the clamp on. like that. And I'm going to repeat the same action on the other side with another big heavy clamp. Now I'm just going to wire everything up. We'll connect up the microphone. We will connect up the amplifier on the other side. We'll hook it up to the computer and then we're going to do the first test. All right, everything looks good here. We're going to test the small unported PVC foam board speaker without any insulation on it. We're going to use the Roo Equalization Wizard, Room Equalization Wizard, R-E-W. You can see the little identifier up here, and we're going to do a measurement. Now, usually when you start these out, you can check a level, but just notice these numbers up here. We're going to check from 100 to 12,000 hertz. We're going to scan over a period of about 10 seconds, and to get sort of an equalized level whenever you're starting a test series. You can check the volume and see what it looks like. 47.7, anything from about 40 to 60 decibels, even 30 to 60 decibels is a reasonable number. Let's do a, a scan. Okay, I'm going to put some variable smoothing on this, even though there's meaning in some of these oscillations. Uh, we're going to be comparing each of the different speakers over more large scale, strategic kinds of numbers. And so I think it makes it easier to see. Now what we're going to do is we're going to go and compare this uh, with the large insulated version of this foam speaker and see what that looks like.
doing the overlay right now. Now you can see that the difference from a larger speaker with the padding on the inside is very, very small. The one thing that you will notice, because the first scan that we took is this one, is that with the uh, padding, we do lose some of the output at the lower frequencies down here, but otherwise remarkably similar. It's the same driver, of course, so you wouldn't expect it to be much different. Now what we're going to do is the small, uninsulated, non-ported concrete speaker. This is a lot heavier. All right, now we're going to measure the non-ported, small, non-insulated concrete speaker. Smooth it. And we'll take a look at the overlay. Remarkably similar to the other small speaker. So clearly the, the padding on the inside, which we did on the second version, did decrease some of the low frequency output. It actually didn't help anything. But if we eliminate that, you'll notice that the difference between the concrete and the PVC board is negligible. There's really not much of an advantage to the very, very heavy and more difficult to construct enclosure. Even though concrete sounds sexy, not so sure it's worth it. Now what we're going to do, just for thoroughness, let's go ahead and check the large insulated concrete non-ported speaker. This is a beast. The next one's a real beast. All right, now what we're going to do is we're going to check the large, non-ported, insulated concrete speaker. Now when we compare this to the initial, this is the initial, this down here is the last graph, the uh, purple line. You can see that the difference between uh, the non-ported, non-insulated foam small speaker versus the heavy concrete speaker with the uh, insulation on the inside is relatively, relatively little. But what you'll also notice is that the concrete speaker, once again, because of the insulation, loses some of its performance on the uh, low frequency. If we look at the other speaker that also had the insulation, you'll see that they both have that same drop in the lower frequencies. So adding insulation inside these boxes doesn't really help. If anything, it hurts and it makes it uh, decreases the equalization across here. So now what we're going to do is I'm going to port one of the speakers. I'll take the small concrete speaker and we'll compare it ported and unported and see what the effect of porting them is. What a beast! And I'm not talking about me. So now I'm going to remove the ports from the previous test. And we're going to retest the speaker unported or ported. So actually I removed the plugs 
and made it a ported speaker now. Now this is going to be the ported version of the small concrete uninsulated speaker. Now let's compare this to the ported version of the same speaker, which was actually our third test. So we don't want the first one, we don't want the second one, we want the third one, and we want the fifth one. And we don't want the fourth one. Okay, so you can see that when we port this, we gain a lot in the low frequency. Almost nothing changes here. If anything, there's a slight improvement at this dip. Uh, we lose this little diddly bits. Uh, but basically, you gain, what, about five decibels in the lower frequencies. If anything, uh, you lose a little bit at the higher frequencies. But this is a big difference, and it's effectively about the same as when we use the insulated version. For example, the last speaker that I tested, which was the insulated version of the concrete speaker, This is when you add insulation and porting. Big deal. Otherwise, again, relatively similar, but probably a good idea to port your speakers, and it's probably not a good idea to insulate your speakers, and it's also probably not a good idea to bother to spend all the time and effort to build concrete speakers. Now what we're going to do is we're going to infuse some helium into the back of one of the foam speakers and see what the effect of helium is on the operation of the driver. Now I may need a little bit of help from you to feed that helium line in. Uh, On the tank, you see that tubing? Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna connect this up here. And that'll let the helium in and give us the ability to decompress it so we don't blow the diaphragm out of the speaker. But that's, that's basically how this works. Now, what I'm gonna do here though, is I'm gonna come around the back. Good. Now we're gonna give this a couple minutes because I wanna make sure I don't wanna run this under a high pressure and push the diaphragm out. So we're just gonna let this bleed in there for a minute or two just to make sure we've flushed it with helium. And then we'll see what the effect of the low density gas is behind the driver. All right, now the helium has been running for about three minutes and that should be enough to flush it. So let's go ahead and do a measurement. Now this is again the non-insulated foam speaker, the small one. So we're gonna compare it to the first that we did, the first measurement we did. I'm gonna smooth this, and then we'll do an overlay. And as you can see, this is exactly the same speaker setup in exactly the same mode, but all the way across the board, you get a little bit, maybe two decibels, two and a half decibels of increased volume output with the same power input. It makes sense because the, the speaker, obviously the driver has to move in and out when it's making the noise, sound, music. And when you put a very light mass behind it, the helium has ver virtually uh, like 1 16th the mass of, of air. There's very little for the speaker to have to work against on the return trip. So all that sound that would have been bouncing around inside the chamber uh, is not wasted and just the resilience of the, the driver is what we're looking at in terms of of um, sound output. So as it makes sense, if you want a little more power from your speakers, you can put some helium behind them. We used aluminum domed speakers specifically because I anticipated we put the helium in there and it'll retain it a lot longer than any, any of the organics will. Metals uh, block helium very effectively. So now the last test we're gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and turn one of the speakers around and we're gonna see just how well the anechoic chamber itself works by having the sound have to move around within it in order to get to the microphone.
Now I'm applying the foam material, this board behind here, simply because I don't want the sound from the back of the speaker to be contaminating the actual reflectivity measurement of the, of the um, chamber. So now what we're going to do is take a look at the concrete, non-insulated, unported speaker facing the opposite direction against the back wall and look to see what kind of reflectivity we get inside of the anechoic chamber itself. And let's see, unported concrete was our third measurement. So when we do the overlay, we're going to look at number three and this one. And something else is sticking in there. Good. So as you can see, at the very lowest frequencies, which is the very most difficult thing to be able to block, the anechoic chamber isn't doing very much to prevent uh, sound. We're getting a little off the back of the speaker simply because I wasn't able to block it. But you can see once you move to about 200 decibels, the amplitude of the signal goes down about, I would say about 15 decibels here, and then it continues to drop off. And at 4K and above, it's, it's off the graph. You can see that if you were willing to invest even more, to get the lower frequencies down, that would require substantially more of the insulating material. Low frequencies are very difficult to block compared to high frequencies because the long wavelength as it moves through the absorbing material produces a more gradually changing pressure wave. And it's that pressure wave, the differential pressure on say the outside and the inside or on, on the fibers as it moves through the pad that causes the fibers to compress and rub against each other, and that's what eats up the energy. So low frequencies, because at a given sound pressure level, similar amplitude, as that pressure changes more slowly, it moves farther through the material, and the material sees that frequency as being a very small differential across the face. So in order to block very low frequencies, you need a very thick piece of material so that you can eventually get a fair differential across the material from this very slow sloping sound wave. If you had very intense sound waves, you can do this and block this with much thinner pieces of material. Nevertheless, this is the honest output and the uh, reflectivity performance of this uh, anechoic chamber that we built. I'm sure you can find better ones if you spend about 15 million, but this was a pretty good budget operation. Now we're gonna go downstairs and what I'm gonna do is you're gonna set up sort of a version of the anechoic chamber, but now we're gonna look at the materials themselves that are gonna be used to block the sound. We're gonna see how bad a speaker is in a really bad environment, and what happens as we piece in different types of anti-reflection material to the sides of our, our little chamber, and we'll analyze the different things you saw at the beginning of the video. See you in a sec. All right, I set up one of the speakers here at the same distance from the microphone as it was in the anechoic chamber. And then I placed some padding here and here simply to simplify some of the added noise of measuring the reflections in here and so we can look more accurately at the panels themselves. The first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you just how bad an acoustic environment this lab is. We will compare the unfiltered output from this speaker down here to the unfiltered output of the speaker up in the anechoic chamber just to give an idea of what the anechoic chamber was doing. So let's start now with an analysis of just what the room looks like. Same frequency range, same sweep rate, and basically the same volume set up on the amplifier. Here we go. Pretty noisy. I don't know if you remember this, but we'll, I'll give you an overlay in just a little bit, but you'll see this is all the reflections off the surfaces of the walls. So it's a pretty noisy environment in here. Now what we're gonna do is I'm gonna put a couple of panels on either side that is simply bring the hard surfaces in to the same distance that we're gonna be testing all of the non-reflective materials so that we get a even to even kind of comparison between the surfaces, not just the distances.
And then I'm also going to add a pad up here on top, again, because I only want to compare these sides. I don't want the ceiling to add additional reverberations that just don't uh, change from measurement to measurement. Good. Now let's take another measurement. Now in all of these scans, I'm not going to be filtering or doing any kind of uh, adaptive filtering so that we can see all of the small vibrations that occur here. This way we can see where things are reflecting, not just sort of the overall performance of the driver. And if we look at the overlay here, not really any significant difference in terms of the amount of these fine, high resolution reflections. But you can see there are a couple of very, very, very acute areas where the, probably the uh, material itself is resonating and effectively it's absorbing the sound more effectively. That's why you get these peaks down here and then probably here you had the same sort of thing happening from the walls at a greater distance. Lower frequency, larger distance kind of makes some sense. So now what we're going to do is we're going to add something to see if we can reduce the amount of reflection noise that we get on these panels as they're approximate to the chamber, but we're going to put something soft on top of them. All right, so like the uh, YouTuber uh, DIY Perks who had analyzed using bath towels, we decided to do an analysis of using them at sort of a glancing angle with the sound. So I've taken four very inexpensive bath towels and attached them in front of those hard surfaces. So this would be similar to what you'd have if you just took this kind of material and put it directly in front of your drywall or some sort of a hard surface in your home. Now we're going to put these back together just like they were in the previous test. Now let's see what the towels do. A little bit less reflection. So let's overlay this. All right, so we don't want the first part because that's basically the raw room. So you can see here that with the blue, we get a lot less of these very, very deep dips that we got with the hard panels. There must be some decrease in the resonance at that point and the resonance coupling. You can also see here, if I separate these a little bit, you can see that most of the reflection though, although it varies a little bit in terms of its, its uh, position, the amplitude is not that much different, on, different until you get to the higher frequencies. Just like as you'll see with the foam, the towels work pretty well to decrease the difference between these different peaks, but more or less, it's a high frequency phenomenon. Once you go to the lower frequencies, I'm not so sure that this most recent scan is really any different. So towels, they work. Uh, but I'm not so sure they work that much better than just the hard surfaces. Now let's go ahead and see what happens if we take some of the corrugated foam and replace it. Once again, I'll just make it clear. The green is the original with the hard surface, and the blue is the one with the four layers of towels in front of it. So now what we're going to do is put the foam on. So these look a little more attractive than the towels, and they cost a little bit more, but these are typically what you put on onto surfaces in order to ostensibly get low reflectivity of sound. So we're going to put these in. We're going to see what kind of performance we get from these. Now let's see how the corrugated foam works, pyramid foam. All right, so let's compare that then to the second, which was just the hard panels and see what that looks like. So look at the overlay here. And so we want number two and the last one. And again, you can see this 
definitely does very little at the low frequencies. Maybe a little bit of a loss of some of these green um, decreases in sound reflection, again, due to resonance. But not really a lot of a decrease in terms of the uh, differential in reflectivity. It just changes the positions. So for example, here we reflect more at this frequency. Here we reflect a little bit more at a slightly lower frequency. It's almost like this is a mirror image of this. Um, nevertheless, it looks like the foam compared to, we will look at the towels. Now remember the pinker is the foam and the towel. And if anything, you see more spikes and a little bit more noise. I'll just separate these a little bit. It's not decibel ratings, just, just so you can see them. Not really a significant difference, but I would say, if anything, probably a little bit more peakiness to the towel at the uh, lower frequencies. And then at the upper frequencies, the towel may actually perform just about as well. Again, not a significant difference. So it's a matter probably of aesthetics versus cost. This will cost you a little bit more than the towels, but it certainly looks a lot nicer, especially if the towels aren't clean and new. So now what we're going to do is take a look at something a little bit more conventional. These are classic ceiling tiles, Armstrong acoustic tiles. They're very inexpensive at about $5 a sheet US. And they come in this size. We didn't have to cut anything down. And they may work pretty effectively. And they look a lot like a typical recording studio. So it's not that bad a look. All right, so let's take a look at these. Acoustic panels. Okay, hmm, not bad. Let's go ahead and compare this to number two, which was just the hard surfaces. That's what we got. So pretty impressive. These acoustic panels seem to get rid of a lot of the big peaks, and they seem to work decently, at least up to about five or six kilohertz. So not a bad deal. You lose all of these dips, and even the generalized peak to trough is certainly no bigger at the lower frequencies, and if anything, I would say slightly less. So not bad. These aren't bad for $5 a piece. So these are the lowest cost option of all. Uh, there's sort of a urban rumor, myth, maybe it isn't a myth, that egg cartons can be used to absorb sound. They do have the convoluted surface and they are very non-resonant. And if you go to a food service or a big restaurant, these things are delivered in cartons that are generally about 12 uh, layers high and they normally throw them out. So if you just ask some friend or somebody you've got a good relationship with uh, to save them for you, we got these things from uh, a local hospital and I probably have about 30 of them. So free is nice. I adhered these onto the surface just with some of that spray adhesive so it's very easy to do. And they're extremely lightweight. So let's go ahead and do another measurement. Maybe not bad. Let's take a look at this. So this is uh, compared to the, the original hard panel and you might see a small decrease in the amount of the amplitude of some of these reflections, but not much. It just seems to relocate some of them and doesn't touch others. And frequency wise, probably not much of a difference all the way across the spectrum. If we look at this compared to the acoustic tiles that we just tested, you can see that the acoustic tiles appear to work a little bit better. Um, they definitely have different positions for their amplitude variations, but the difference between these two are, is small enough that you could probably get away with using these egg cartons, but I don't think they're superior to the other material. They're obviously free, and they are interesting to look at. So let's move on. 
like I said, if you've got a lot of extra toilet paper around, this isn't necessarily the cheapest, but if you've got extra and you don't think you're going to need it in the next couple of years, this provides corrugation, a soft, non-resonant surface, and certainly is a conversation starter. All right, let's see how this works. gap there. Let's do an overlay and let's look at the first hard panel versus that. All right, so you can see that it does have some effect, but what's interesting is it seems like it just simply reduces the amount of sound. It's actually absorbing a fair amount of sound at this wavelength and if anything, it's damaging because it may actually absorb more sound at one particular wavelength than at, say, another wavelength. And so you'll get a, a change in sound. It's not necessarily always good to reduce your overall amplitude as long as you're getting the same reflective components in each. So I would say the toilet paper is actually not working very well here down at the lower frequencies. But it is remarkably effective at reducing high frequency. This is pretty stunning. Now, you do, this is not even smoothed, and so I'd say at the very high frequencies, there's no question that the, uh, the toilet paper rolls works su surprisingly well. And at the lower frequencies, except for this little dip between about 401 kilohertz in terms of overall output, um, it's, it's pretty remarkable. Certainly, a uh, parametric equalizer could bring the amplitude up here, but you would still get a few of these spikes. Overall, very interesting. So now let's see what happens if uh, we don't use the toilet paper, but we just take the, the rolls off of the Roxel pads and let's see how they operate. All right, this pretty much goes without saying. Plain Roxel pads. Not bad. Overlay. And we're going to compare that to the original hardwood, which is this here. And we're going to eliminate the toilet paper. So you can see it follows some of the same patterns, but most importantly, we get a lot less resonance at the lower frequencies. This is where I think this makes a significant difference. And it doesn't dip as far here, but it has a similar pattern because it's obviously at the same spacing as the hard pattern, as the hard material. It doesn't have these huge resonant dips because it simply doesn't resonate and works well at the high frequencies and at the low frequencies. This is an excellent material. I'm pretty impressed with this. And if we think back, let's see, this one here was the toilet paper. This one here was the egg carton. And this one here was the acoustic panels, which is the other sort of acoustically designed material. And we compare these two. I would say that the Roxel works similar to the acoustic panels in that it has a little bit of a bigger dip at the same location, uh, does not have this dip here, and appears to follow a little bit of a flatter path. So I think given uh, the same sort of cost per panel and the availability of the material. I'd probably choose the, the Roxel soundboard or the acoustic panels or maybe use both in the same room. These are, these are excellent and they're the simplest and the easiest. The last thing we have to remember is that the Roxel panels are made out of a rock wool and it's much less irritating than fiberglass but it still is potentially going to give up some particles. So you probably want to put something in front of it if you're going to have it lining the inside of a room. And so what we're going to do now is we're just simply going to put the uh, acoustic foam in front of it. It makes it appear nicer. It's going to obviously add cost. 
and we'll see if it has any benefit in terms of the acoustic performance. Okay, so obviously this goes without saying. We'll just put the same corrugated foam or pyramid foam that we had originally put on the uh, hard panel. We've now got it on the rock salt panel. It's not unpleasant, but it's probably not the best thing in the world to breathe. All right, looks pretty similar to the plain rock sole to me. Let's see what it shows up as. So we want the last one, and we want the second to the last one. We don't need anything else. Okay, so if we look at just the rock sole foam board or sound board, and then we cover it with this, uh, this foam padding, we actually see somewhat of a deterioration in the performance. It actually works better without the additional foam on top of it. At the highest frequencies, probably not much of a difference. We just see a difference in the amplitude here and up here, down here, down here, up here. But down here, substantially more resonances from the foam added onto the rock cell. And there's nothing there except for the foam and little spray adhesive that holds them in the corners. So it's not much of a, you know, no additional material. And at the very lowest frequencies, I would say, if anything, once again, this is certainly not inferior to this, and if anything, probably slightly better. And definitely here, there's more reflective noise. So my recommendation would be that if you're going to be using these materials inside, say, of a studio or someplace where aesthetics is not huge, definitely I would use a carpet on the floor because you have to walk on it. I wouldn't walk on any of these materials. On the ceiling, I would definitely use the acoustic ceiling tiles. They're made for it, and there's systems that are used to hold them up. They're not necessarily the most attractive material, but they're very inexpensive and flexible. And then on the walls, I would use the rock sole panel panels, or I would use the acoustic panels. And if I use the rock sole, which is my slight preference, I would probably cover them with a very thin layer of uh, cloth, uh, some sort of a very fine silk or uh, polyester cloth porous enough that the uh, sound can get through it. it, has no reflective properties, it's the same sort of thing you'd put on a speaker case, but uh, it'll keep the fibers in and at the same time make it look a little bit nicer. Ultimately, you could also put the acoustic tiles on the walls and they would do just about as well. Uh, I would not recommend going to the egg crate. I do not think that the towels uh, performed very well. Uh, the toilet paper is a bit of a joke, but um, the only thing that I found remarkable in the, the toilet paper was that it did really block the very high frequencies. So if you knew you were working with that kind of uh, frequency, like say dental drills, you know, that, that very high 4,000 plus uh, hertz frequency range, there may be an advantage to it. But nevertheless, I think this gives you some information and makes it uh, clear that you don't necessarily have to get really fancy or go way out in uh, Never Never Land to produce a fairly good acoustic environment. So when we put all this together and you get to see all the different panels at the end of the video, uh, we'll label them and we'll go through this so you're not bouncing back and forth through the video trying to decide which you like and you know if my arguments are sound. We'll label the individual graphs and we'll also compare them to some of the, uh, the baseline. For example, we'll compare the non-filtered graphs of the room with the non-filtered graphs of the um, anechoic chamber just to give an idea of how it works and then we'll use the filtered or the variable variably filtered uh, graphs to show some of the uh, differences between the speakers which is easier to see when you look at uh, just the performance of the speaker material itself. So hopefully useful video not necessarily explosions and smoke bombs and boats but this is the kind of stuff that you need uh, to use if you're trying to build something that's going to work and it's going to be effective. And if you find this interesting, we're going to be doing other videos on sound in the future using our anechoic chamber, as well as uh, we've decided to build an LRAD device, literally a long range acoustic projector. And that might be an interesting uh, alternative to trying to keep things quiet. So please hit the notification bell if you're willing to subscribe and uh, send me a comment because I read them all. And if you have questions about any of this, I'm happy to answer them. You have a good evening. Take care. And good night.